Tell me if you've heard this one before. Coal is as bland as a bag of bread. Now, I understand why people would think this, especially during the first game before he got a revamp when Eric Layden took the helm. In the first game, his performance is nearly monotone and angry most of the time, sounding almost like Batman from Chris Nolan films. He's apathetic towards other people for a good chunk of the game, and in the last few hours, he just turns into an all-out vengeful rage machine. Despite this, it always confuses me when people claim that Delson is a better character than Cole. I know that more people have probably played Second Son and never experienced the first two games, and therefore, they simply have a sentimental value towards him for being the first protagonist they played as. Honestly and truthfully, you might be able to pin the same thing on me for Cole since he has lightning powers and my first Pokemon was Pikachu. But then again, it wasn't like I really was given a choice since my first Pokemon game was Yellow version. Either way, I just want to take a few minutes to explain why I think Cole is a little more than your average slice of bread. In fact, if you're willing to look beyond his somewhat crusty exterior, you might find an interesting character with more internal layers than you once thought. Now. I will be approaching this video as an analysis on Cole's character, which means that it will be based on my interpretation of his character that Sucker Punch created. Each of us have a different interpretation of a creative property, which is what makes movies, books, and games so entertaining. After all, part of the fun of any of those activities is interpreting what you see and any good writer doesn't spoon-feed all the information to the audience and lets them create their own idea of their work. Now, with that disclaimer out of the way, let's get on with the essay. Cole McGrath was once to our average everyday bike messenger, but before that, he was a successful student in high school, going as far as to take college preparatory classes over other electives to get a head start. However, just six credits short of graduating from college, one of his professors mistreated a friend of his and Cole dropped out on the spot. He then becomes a bike messenger in order to spite his parents. Not much is known about Cole's parents, but what we do know is that Cole's father was strict, often disappointed and berating of him even carrying a picture of Trish in his wallet because he sees her as the daughter he never had, impatient for her and Cole to get married. At the same time, his decision to drop out of college and become a bike messenger deeply spurns his mother, who lies to everyone she knows that Cole is instead a teacher, as she believes that no one respects someone in his current occupation. From this, we are alluded to the history that Cole may have had with his parents. Imagine that they are the overly strict parents that expect the world out of their eldest child, the best education, the best spouse, the best paying job, of course, any parent would want the best for their children. But even one deviation from their plan that Cole does is unforgivable and brings them disgrace. Ultimately, Cole's professor's treatment of his friend is a reflection of how his parents treated him, and so he decides to take his life into his own hands, to live for himself in his own margin of happiness than live to make people who treat him like dirt happy. At this point, he becomes distant from his family, including his younger brother. He devalues his own life to get back at them, taking a low-paying job he hates and getting into complications with law enforcement with his friend Zeke, who has no family or job to speak of as he makes money selling people deficient homemade batteries. The best thing he has in his life at this point is an intelligent girlfriend who loves him for who he is and not his job or success. One day his boss shoves a package into his arms that only Cole could deliver. Upon arriving at the address, he received a call from Kessler, who bribes him to open the box for $500. As he did so, Cole's life would be changed forever. The race fear gives Cole electrical powers, but his powers come with a price. The sacrifice of thousands of civilians and Trish's sister Amy, as well as releasing the plague onto Empire City. Trish and Zeke stay at his bedside for two weeks until he wakes up, dismissing the notion that superpowers are real. But when Trish confirms that electricity was flying from his body, Cole changes his tone concerned that his powers could hurt the people around him. A few days later, and Cole must make his debut as a conduit when the Reapers come to claim the rations dropped by the government. At this point, we get an idea of how a decaying society affects Cole's character, and in an every man for himself scenario, he will either put the survival of himself and his friends first, or place himself in the reluctant position that no one else would be willing to help people, so he must be the example. Regardless of his karma, we see that he truly values Zeke and Trish. Upon making his decision, a recording is televised by the voice of survival that Cole had been holding the bomb that threw Empire City into disarray. Suddenly, Cole's life takes a familiar turn. The citizens despise Cole and attack him on sight. Trish walks away without a word, in grief, believing that her boyfriend murdered her sister. With the entire city out to get him, Cole decides to run away from his problems by attempting to escape Empire City. 
This leads to him running into Moya Jones, who tasks him with finding the race fear and NSA agent John White in return for amnesty and passage from the city. Little does Cole know that this information was fed to her by Kessler in order to set him on his path to undeveloping his powers. Cole begrudgingly agrees, only following Moya's orders so he can get out of the chaos of Empire City. His path occasionally crosses with Trish, even though she still harbors ill feelings towards him, he never once blames her or calls her out for her unfair treatment of him. All he does is occasionally ask if they are okay after he completes a task for her, and not in the pathetic begging way. He knows that Trish is a reasonable and rational woman, and grief is a powerful stimulant for distress. Meanwhile, Cole is on the receiving end of Zeke's growing envy for being a real-life superhero, which brings out an inferiority complex that eventually becomes a problem. Eventually, Cole encounters the white-hooded leader of the First Sons, Kessler, who latches onto his head and shows him a vision of the future where civilization had been destroyed. Before he can get any answers, Kessler vanishes, leaving Cole to only deduce that he would be the cause of these events. Upon hunting down and defeating Sasha, he ponders as he looks down at her in disgusted pity. Is this what my powers are going to do to me? A warped body and twisted mind? Is that my future? A question that remains to haunt him in the back of his mind. Even as he encounters Alden and Kessler, it is the one constant that he continues to see. Conduits with disfigured bodies and unhinged minds bent on causing chaos and suffering. Later, as Cole is helping Trish transport medical supplies, Alden tosses her and the bus onto the roof of the hospital. In her near-death encounter, Trish comes to realize how her grief had led her to treat Cole unfairly and reconciles the relationship. As he patches up one friendship, his ties to Zeke are strained as he tries to compensate for his inferiority and gets himself captured and allows Alden to escape and slaughter several cops. With each mistake or excuse he makes, Cole lectures him and begins to echo Kessler's soliciting warnings towards him. You still don't get it, do you? You don't get any second chances. Every time you fail, someone's world ends. Ends in the worst way imaginable. I know you mean well, Zeke, but the world is changing. You make a mistake now and you're as good as dead. We have to be careful now. All of us. Eventually, Cole meets John and is told to bring someone he could trust to steal the race sphere back from Alden. With little other choice, he calls Zeke to come to help, even though the two are nearly ready to strangle each other. As they climb the tower, Cole expresses how little his life has really changed since getting his powers. He's still an errand boy, doing what other people tell him instead of living for himself. At the top of the tower, Zeke pries the ray sphere out of its socket and finds himself caught between Alden and Kessler. In a reactionary moment of fear, jealousy, and spite, Zeke activates the ray sphere in order to gain superpowers, willing to trade hundreds of lives to get himself out of trouble. When nothing happens, Kessler replies almost instantly as if he had predicted this moment and tells Zeke he could give him powers, and Cole watches as his best friend gives him a glare and runs off with him. As Cole crosses into the First Son's territory, the situation goes from bad to worse as Kessler contacts him and says he has kidnapped Trish. Upon disarming a series of bombs, Kessler places a choice before him, to save Trish or six doctors, all of which are being dangled off a roof with a remote release system. With only enough time to climb one building, Cole saves the doctors and leaves Trish to fall to her death. He revives her long enough for her to say how she was proud of him for using his powers to help people. Cole then spends the rest of the first game obliging to John's request in order to get revenge against Kessler. When the two locate the Ray Sphere, Cole must decide to either destroy it or use it again to become even stronger. Whichever choice he makes, he credits his loss of Trish as his main motivation, to keep the immense loss from ever happening again. And then the unthinkable happens, and the Ray Sphere goes critical, creating a vortex that sucks John inside. Having survived the ordeal, Cole comes to understand that the city needs protecting from people like Kessler. Or if you're on the evil side, he'll claim that in a dog-eat-dog -dog world that he is the strongest, and he'll kill Kessler to prove it. Here we get the ominous foreshadowing of the truth. I remember your voice now. You were there after the bomb went off. I've always been there, Cole. Every step of your life. Kessler is a seemingly omniscient figure, and during the fight, the attacks he uses are oddly familiar as if they are more powerful versions of Cole's powers. When at last Kessler is defeated, his last words are, Trish, I love you. Please forgive me. And then he proceeds to give Cole one final vision to clarify what his master plan was all along. It turns out that Kessler's foresight is actually retrospection, as he shows Cole a synopsis of his life where the beast appeared and was rampaging across the country. 
Rather than fight and defeat it while it was still relatively weak, Kessler ran with his wife and two daughters for years, forsaking the fate of the rest of the world. When finally their luck runs out, the beast kills his family and has already decimated the population. Even if he fought back now, he had already failed. In his compounding grief and regret, he gains a new power, to travel backwards in time and lands around the 1920s era of America. He wrests control of the first sons from Alden's family and accelerates the development of the race sphere. And we get the big reveal as the camera focuses on a picture of Cole and Trish's wedding with Zeke as the best man. Kessler is Cole McGrath. With this revelation, Cole's perception of reality breaks. He realizes that the life that he thought he was making for himself was never in his control. From the day he was born, Kessler had been watching him in the shadows, manipulating the events of his life and his relationships with people. He killed Trish and made Zeke betray Cole so that he would have no emotional connection so that when the time came, he would have no reason to hold back and defeat the beast. He worked together with the government, including DARPA and the NSA, so that the race sphere could be created and the quarantine would go into effect, preventing Cole from running away and facing the obstacles that he ultimately placed before him. Even his meeting with John and leaving the race sphere to become a MacGuffin was in his plan. As Kessler crumples to the ground, lifeless, Cole says, I take one last look down at myself, my future self, and turn away, the rage curdling inside. I hate everything about Kessler, but when the time comes, I will be ready. And then begins to speak on his uncertainties for the future. I thought this would be the end. That once Kessler and the race sphere were gone, my life would go back to normal. But now I understand that this is my life. That there's no going back. That the gift of these powers will be my burden until the day I die. The people around here, they love me. How long will that last? What's going to happen the first time they expect me to be there for them and I'm not? I don't even know who to trust. Moya is still running around, planning God knows what. And Zeke, I don't know what to think. I've never been more alone. In the following weeks, Cole helps out what remains of the police force in Empire City, clearing out the remnants of the Reapers, Dustmen, and more personally, the First Sons. He continues to enact his rage of Trisha's death against them, as if killing them all will ease his grief. And even though Zeke is actively trying to help, Cole dismisses him and shrugs off his attempts to reconstruct their friendship. One night over dinner, Cole exposes his resentment for Kessler when Zeke tries to apologize for Trisha's death. You're sorry, Kessler's sorry, everybody's sorry. Kessler? What the hell's he gotta do with anything? I'm Kessler. Or rather, he's me. Listen, man. You alright? That doesn't make a lick of sense. Look at it. How? How's this possible? You guys never got married. Kessler gave it to me right before he died. It's his wedding photo. He was me, from the future. Came back in time to set all this up. The race fear, my powers, the quarantine. Trish and him were married, had two kids, and he killed her. He murdered his own wife. And you know why? Because something bad is coming. He called it the Beast, said it's going to destroy the world unless I stop it. So he decided to toughen me up, and get me ready. He showed you all that when he locked onto your face? Yeah. I know you're sorry, Zeke. But every time I look at you, all I see is Kessler's face, laughing at me. And it makes me want to strangle the life out of you. I know. You're all I got left, Zeke. But by God, I hate your guts. Later, while Zeke is fixing up a car for the police, Cole asks him, What I told you last night. You believe me? About you and Kessler? Yeah. Of course I do. Why wouldn't I? Because it's insane. Take a look around, man. Same went out the window weeks ago. I can't keep going like this, Zeke. I'm not eating, not sleeping, can't think straight. It's like Kessler's everywhere and I can't shake him. He's dead, Cole. It's over. See, that's the thing. It's never going to be over. He took away everything that made me what I am. And I don't think I can rebuild myself. After I took off with Kessler, he locked me up in a room. Just a bed, TV, and a piss bucket. But a couple times, he came stumbling in, drunk off his ass. And he'd sit on the floor and stare at me. Sometimes he'd look like he was going to say something, but he never did. After an hour or so, he'd just get up and leave. Then one day he comes in and tells me goodbye. Thanks me for being such a good friend all these years. Figured he was nuts, you know. 
I had no idea what he was going on about. Now it all makes sense. I understand. Why are you telling me this? Hell, I don't know, man. Maybe because at the end of the day, you just gotta remember that he was just some guy. He wasn't nothing special. And that just because he did this to you doesn't mean he controls you. You're your own man, Cole. Always will be. These few panels bring to light exactly how Cole is dealing with this internal struggle of self-identity. Learning the truth about Kessler and his life wasn't something that Cole easily shook off. It affected him in a deeply personal and psychological way. The imposing and omniscient being that Cole sees Kessler as is, from Zeke's perspective, a creation of his mind. To Zeke, Kessler was just as easily a normal guy, no different from Cole or anyone else. This contrast of mindset shows exactly how Cole is struggling within his own mind. Later, Cole and Zeke are attacked by a large four-armed conduit named David Warner, whom Kessler had tested the race sphere on 11 times and mutated him so much to the point that he could only see on a genetic level. Out for revenge, David hunts down Cole, unable to differentiate him from Kessler. David is proven to be too much of a match for Cole, and he is forced to lure him away before Moya launches a missile to temporarily disable David. After this encounter, Cole gets the keys to the apartment from Zeke, and designs himself to be bait so that David can kill him without anyone else nearby. While in the apartment, Cole looks back on old photos of Trish and is overcome by grief. He falls asleep on the couch and dreams of Kessler leading him to a hilltop with three graves, one for Trish and each of his daughters. As the ground begins to crack apart, Kessler reminds him that he'll need to become ruthless and willing to make choices that will cost lives for the greater good, no matter whose bones those graves leave behind. Upon waking up, he is assaulted by Moya's soldiers who gas him with Sauce's hallucinogenic toxin. He begins to see and hear Trish, who berates him for not saving her, leaving Cole curled into a ball and beaten by the ghosts of his mistakes. Eventually, Cole escapes Moya's hold on him with help from Sasha herself, and he's about to run from David again. However, Moya releases her own handmade forced conduits, who are ripped to shreds almost as soon as they enter the battle. Seeing this, Zeke and Warden Harms resign to flee. However, the spectacle has Cole frozen solid, lost in his thoughts. David is not the beast. He is simply a great adversary on Cole's path to becoming the world's savior. If he runs from David, he will have no hope of staying to fight when it matters the most upon the beast's arrival. He knows the end result if he continues to run, the inevitable deaths of those he cherishes. At this moment, he thinks to himself, I quit college six credits short, graduation. Got pissed off by how a professor treated a friend of mine, and walked away. Been walking away ever since. From my dad, from jobs, from myself. Look where it's gotten me. That all changes. Right here, right now. My days of running away are over. Rather than resign himself to be like Kessler, the version of himself that he abhors and despises, he faces down David and chooses to fight, rather than run. The battle does not come easy, and Cole is thrashed and tossed around, but eventually he ends the fight with a lightning storm, causing the aircraft carrier to split apart and begin to sink. Having claimed victory, Cole turns back and tries to save Moya, but she instead urges him to forget her and run before the water kills him. He reluctantly leaves her to drown as the ship disappears into the harbor. Now with Moya and David no longer a threat, Cole and Zeke look forward to taking some time to relax as the city slowly begins to recover from the quarantine. But it isn't long before Cole receives a phone call from Lucy Quo, telling him that she will be able to help him prepare for the beast's arrival if he accompanies her to New Marais. However, just as the team are climbing aboard the ship ready to sail to New Marais, Chaos unfolds in the city. It takes Cole no time at all to guess what the cause is. As he responds to the threat, his fears are quickly confirmed as buildings fall apart, buses are chucked like rocks and civilians plummet into the bay as ships go up in flames. After trading initial blows, Cole is near instantly knocked momentarily unconscious. As he shakes off the disorientation and picks himself up, he comes face to face with... The battle is short but intense, as Cole holds nothing back to defeat it. However, he is caught off guard and the beast turns the tables. Cole is nearly killed by the encounter and has no choice but to run with his tail tucked between his legs as he watches Empire City fall to ruin in a flash of light. As he recuperates, he has sleepless nights haunted by nightmares of the beast and the deaths that he failed to prevent. When the moment came, he faced down his fears. He took the lesson he learned and poured in every last bit of effort to defeat the beast. When the moment came, he set himself apart from Kessler, from the persona of his selfishness and failures. 
but still he could not avoid running and seeing his nightmares brought to life. But from this, he takes up another lesson. He bolsters himself, much like he did with Trish's death, that he will not allow himself to fail again. He will not stand by and watch this creature destroy all life as he knew it. He stood with his head held high, ready to take on the challenge of gaining new powers in Numeray, while acknowledging that he was willing to pay whatever price to achieve his goal. Upon arriving, he meets Dr. Sebastian Wolf, who immediately mentions the uncanny likeness between Cole and Kessler, to which Cole replies, I know who Kessler is. From here on, Wolf proceeds to explain how to defeat the beast. By using the Rayfield inhibitor he built as an anti-ray sphere, designed to take away Conduit's powers, rather than giving them to people. However, there is a reoccurring theme that he encounters in Numeray, one that he once questioned to himself. The conduits here are nothing short of the warped minds and twisted bodies he once wondered that he would become. Bertrand is a human telling the populace to hate conduits when he himself is a massive slobbering behemoth and sect whose special ability is to corrupt others and turn them into monsters. He also turns the Vermok private military group into insane conduits. And while this is part of his plan, Nix and Quo are not so innocent either. One physically changed by her powers, and the other mentally unhinged and borderline sadistic to other suffering for her amusement. And as Cole himself races to gain more and more power, what is ultimately to become of him? In a perfect twist, Cole discovers that the Beast is not simply a brainless, rampaging monster like Bertrand, but is instead John White, who had been caught in the Ray Sphere implosion. The effect of his body meticulously rebuilding itself had left him horribly scarred, which remains in his giant form, and his eyes are a piercing crimson color, following along with the theme. However, whereas Bertrand is the monster posing as human, John is the human who imposes so much fear in those around him that they only see him as a monster. This line of thinking is repeated when Cole is trying to obtain the final blast core in order to use the RFI to kill him. I grab. John? You, you never told me you were the beast. That name is motivated by fear. Are you afraid, McGrath? Have you seen the new you? We were playing I was hoping we still are. I could use your help. Friends, and back in Empire City, the beast almost killed me. I'm so sorry. The act of rebirth was kind of overwhelming. I was nothing but nerves and impulse, just lashing out at whatever I sensed as a threat. And there was no greater threat than you. You're right about that. But you saw the truth when I cured that woman. There's no other way. Wish there was. John doesn't threaten him or force him to agree to his cause. He just tells him to make the decision that is right to him. He's not mad, insane, or bloodthirsty. He's actually complacent, stoic, and borderline apathetic. He knows what Cole likely thinks of him from Kessler's visions and conditioning. When the moment comes for Cole to use the RFI, he explains the truth behind the beast and even admits that John asked for his help. Cole no longer sees the beast as a monster and recognizes him as a person with his own morals about the same problem they're trying to solve with the plague. When Nyx commands him to do something about it after John inadvertently killed her monsters, he says without hesitation or a second thought, We are. But as he fires up the RFI, fully prepared to end the plague and kill John, Cole, Nyx, and Quo suddenly lock up in pain as smoke billows from their bodies. Zeke reacts quickly and smashes it out of Cole's hands. From then, well, observe Cole's reaction for yourself. <sighs> Oh my god. I was dying, I could feel it. It didn't even fire off. It wasn't even fully charged. What the hell did you do, Zeke? What was I supposed to do? Is it broken? I don't know. Let me take a look. A wolf, he knew this was gonna happen. He was setting me up to die. Well, I, I didn't know about this. If I use that thing, it's going to kill us. Kill all conduits, not just the beast. I'll die if you don't. So will millions of others. <sighs> Zeke, we don't know that the RFI will cure the plague. John's method works. I've seen it. Mm. 
He might be the only way that anyone lives through this. I don't care what happens to me. All I care about is that the beast dies. You need to make a decision right now. Are you gonna kill the beast? Be a man of your word. Look, John's plan is not pretty. It's not, but it's right. The conduits are immune to the plague. He needs to make as many as he can before more of the sick die. Think about that. Never thought Quo would lose a nerve. Selfish. Notice the exact points he brings up. All the conduits are going to die. The RFI isn't proven to do what Wolf said it would. John's method works. He even goes so far as to recognize the shift in Quo's morals as selfish. He knows that standing on John's side out of fear isn't a legitimate reason. There's more than what is shown on the surface of his thought process. Cole was given his powers to defeat the beast and save the world. Were he blindly following his destiny, there would be only one choice to make. But it's not that simple. Not when he absolutely abhors the person who decided his future for him. It's not that simple when Kessler's vision and warnings turned out to be a fallacy. Maybe perhaps the beast was a force of unbiased destruction in his time, but in Cole's reality, the beast is a human that's trying to save the world's population. On top of all this, Wolf decided to withhold the truth from Cole that the RFI would kill all conduits. Wolf left dozens of dead drops for him to find, but none of them revealed to him or Quo that it was built to cure the plague or that it would wipe conduits from the face of the earth. In fact, it almost seems as though he didn't want Cole to find out in case that he would change his mind and not kill the beast. Wolf did not trust Cole's integrity, so why should he trust his in return? And if the RFI did not do as Wolf's notes implied, especially now that Zeke had damaged it, would it be worth it to sacrifice all the conduits who survived the plague and risk the possibility that it didn't actually eradicate it? Once he flipped the switch, he would be risking that no one would survive, human or conduit. At least helping John, he would be able to ensure that some people would come out alive in the end. It's a decision between faith or proof. Either way, Cole would have to be willing to sacrifice himself and thousands of people, or Zeke and millions of others. The graves that Kessler referred to would be the blood that stained his hands for all eternity. Does Cole accept the destiny placed before him? Does he continue to do as others tell him to? Or does he finally make a stand and choose his own path without Kessler there to force him to walk a line? Does he instead take the responsibility to ensure humanity's survival, instead of making another wrong choice that would lead to complete decimation? Does he face the problem, or run from it? Should Cole stick to his destiny, he bravely accepts that his death will be in trade for the common good. He and Zeke share one final farewell, and as he stands his ground and watches the beast lumber towards him for their fated battle, he says, Protect the RFI. Going toe to toe with you. Sure? Oh, hell yeah. Never once does John speak during the mission. He only roars and attacks, removing the humanity that we have clearly seen him convey and returning him to our first impression of him, a Neanderthalic giant monster. And then, as Cole is ready to use the RFI, he stops as John approaches for one last attempt to prevent him from doing so, and for the hell of it, goes on an overkill streak to bring him to his knees. However, he also drops a single truthful whisper as Quo breaks down at his inspirational act of integrity and admits she was only afraid to die. I am too. On the other hand, if Cole resists and makes the logical choice, and not the moral choice, Zeke and Nick storm off in a rage. As he meets up with John, he is appreciative to see Cole and Quo join him. He does not think little of Nick's and Zeke for disagreeing. As they rampage through the city, John does not act like much of a monster only attacking those who threaten him or Cole. He does not lash out the city's architecture mindlessly. His voice is calm and reserved, but he does not deny that his plan is horrible, and sometimes, he simply cannot handle the weight of it. He advises Cole to think that the people are dead already, to desensitize him to make it easier. Sort of what Kessler was trying to do by killing Trish and turning Zeke against him. A lot of work went into the minutia of the script to convey all the information you need for John and Cole's mentality to the deaths of the many to save the few. Once Cole has reluctantly killed Nyx and Zeke, the first thing the scene opens with is Cole squatting down, giving Zeke's body a long, hard look and hanging his head in shame. 
And then, he picks up the RFI. The price was too steep. He's reconsidering his decision. It's not too late. He has it in his hand. All it takes is one push of the button to not leave his best friend's death in vain. But then, he throws it back down and grabs his amp. He has to destroy the R5 before his conscience eats away at him. <sighs> With the R5 destroyed, there's truly no turning back. And this is when John's conscience breaks down. His mission led to one friend killing another. Zeke wasn't a faceless person to Cole. He was his platonic brother. As he's ready to give up, Cole's voice has a noticeable tone of rising frustration. What? After all this? No. I believe in the plan. But I'm so tired. I've had enough killing. I should have died a long time ago. John! But I know you. If I gave you the power, you would see it through. And then, before he can protest, John forces his powers upon Cole, turning him into the new beast to continue his mission in his place. As it turns out, Sucker Punch has revealed what Cole really would have done. You might be thinking, yeah, he would have done the good ending. There's no discussion to be had here. But the truth is that Sucker Punch shipped the game with the evil ending as canon. They had intended since Infamous 1 for Cole to side with the Beast. Nate Fox admitted that he wrote the evil ending of Infamous 2 to be canon, and they even had an Infamous 3 planned out. The only reason why the good ending is canon now is because more people play the good ending rather than the evil ending, provided by data derived from the PlayStation Trophy statistics. Now while you may be resistant to this fact, the evidence is actually foreshadowed back in the first game. In the final cutscene where Kessler is revealed to be Cole, there is a visual display of Cole in the quote-unquote Jesus pose, the pose of a messiah. And a few seconds later, a giant face is imposed behind him resembling that of the beast, moving to consume him. If it looks familiar, that's because it is. In the first few seconds of the final cutscene of Infamous 2's evil ending, we get a few seconds of John and Cole both with wide expressions as the power transfer occurs. John's expression is identical to the face behind Cole in Infamous 1, and even Cole's expression is very similar. And then, as Cole concludes his monologue and proceeds to use his newfound power to create conduits, his pose is exactly the same as the pose from the same shot in Infamous 1. This is the culmination of Cole's internal struggle. The struggle to find his identity, his purpose, his path to consider others over himself, to see the big picture, and to face his problems rather than avoid them and allow them to compound. Kessler provided him an incomplete narrative to mold him into a preferable human being, much like his parents. Cole is not the selfish coward that Kessler was, neither is he the perfect person that he or his parents wanted him to be. Now. Cole is the messiah, leading the world into a new age, a god walking on earth. I'd been given powers to save the world from this change, but now I stand at its center. 